All right, good afternoon, everyone. Again, this is the Reverse Logistics Association, members-driven organization focused on retailers, manufacturers, and solutions providers for the reverse industry. Today we have Bruce Brown and Dr. Ron Lemke from the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, Bruce Brown from Information. And on the screen, that we'll talk about the 12N standard smart DPR label. And we will have uh, Dr. Ron Lemke begin a bit about the work that's been done over the last year or two. And uh, Juan. Okay. Thanks, Tony, and thanks to everybody uh, for uh, for calling in today. So yes, I'm I'm at the University of Nevada. Uh, I'm a supply chain guy, uh, background in computer science and industrial engineering, and I've been doing reverse logistics for more than 20 years, um, and been on the RLA standards committee for I don't know six-ish years maybe, and we're very very excited about this 12N project. Uh, and uh, looking forward to telling you all about it. Um, I, we will not get into any technical details today. We're just going to stay focused on how you could use this and why you would care. But uh, hopefully, as we can convince you of the value of it, when you ultimately have, uh, I'm happy to answer them because I've uh, done a, spent a lot of time on this. Uh, and then Bruce Brown will be presenting the majority of the presentation, and Bruce is with the Information Systems, um, and they have developed the software that will make all of this this work. Um, develop creating the, the QR codes, allowing a company to manage and use these these two dimensional barcodes uh, to carry a lot more information than has been previously available. So, hi, thanks, Ron. Um, so, I'm Bruce Brown, and uh, Ron, can you can just just confirm that the slides are showing correctly? Yes, I'm seeing the slide just fine. Okay, great. So, the biggest problem in labeling has always been getting enough information on a label. Uh, labels are very limited. Barcodes are very limited in the amount of space that they have. And today, we're going to talk about a new. American National Standards Institute ANSI standard that lets you put all the information you want on a label, but not only do that, also engage in, with your customers in new ways, increase sales, and simultaneously decrease costs, sort of the ideal of all businesses. Um, so thanks very much for joining us with this overview of the 12N standard. As Ron mentioned, I'm Bruce Brown from Information Solutions. Information is part of the team that Reverse Logistics Association assembled uh, to look at standards. Uh, RLA developed the standard and now manages that standard for ANSI. And um, in shorthand, we'll just call it the 12N standard for today. It's got a kind of a longer name. Uh, information supplies the software tools and systems that create and interpret the 12N labels. Uh, today we're going to take a look at how this standard helps consumers and manufacturers. We're also going to take uh, talk a little bit about how it helps sales and marketing, technical support, returns processing, repairs, refurbishing, uh, logistics, um, compliance with legal requirements for shipping and exporting product, products. There's a lot of information available. Uh, I will give you some references at the end of the presentation for some websites you can check uh, with more details. And uh, obviously, the thing that you're interested in may be a very specific use and uh, I'm to try and give you a great overview today. If you have questions, uh, feel free to click the chat button and I will try and address them uh, during the presentation or at the end, we'll have a Q&A session, so you can uh, type them in, in the chat window if you want now, or we can deal with them at the end of the session. Either way is fine. So, so going back to what I said earlier, the problem with labels has always been that they don't hold enough information. So frequently, you look at products and you see a plethora of labels on them, and you kind of wonder why that is. Um, and 
here's an example. Here's a single product that had eight different barcodes of various kinds on it on the left side of the screen. And um, you'll see in particular in this example that model number is in one barcode, serial number is another barcode. And then on top of that, model number shown twice, serial number shown twice. And you kind of got to wonder why that is. Well, the reason is that one, there's a limited amount of characters that each barcode can handle. Two, there's different barcode standards. And what's resulted is over time, different companies, different trading partners uh, in your supply chain or distribution chain have probably adopted different standards. So you may need one type of barcode for one trading partner, one for another, and you end up sticking the same information on in different formats. Um, the 12N standard represented here by that QR code that you see in the middle, the little dots, allows us to put pretty much all the information that you want on one label and eliminate the need for all these uh, duplicate, duplicate information in different formats. On top of that, it's using modern technology so it can be scanned with a smartphone. So now you can start engaging with your customers in new ways you can uh, actually affect sales and reduce costs. All the things that I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to go into some detail about that, but this is how that information on the left side of the screen on the uh, uh, current product would actually be displayed on a single QR code using the 12N standard uh, and then displaying it on a smartphone. So, that's, oh, okay. Um, so as for what kind of products it can be used with, these 12N labels can be used with pretty much any kind of product. Um, and they can even be used as a data format for electronically transmitting information about a product. So let's take a, a closer look. Um, this is an example of a, another 12N formatted QR code in the uh, sort of upper left border portion of your screen. And by the way, I keep referring to this as the 12N standard or 12N label. Uh, our working name for it was Squirrel. So if I accidentally slip and call it Squirrel Labels, or if you see some prior presentations about this, you may see the word Squirrel used. Uh, but bear in mind, it was just a working name, and we may change the name by the time uh, uh, the marketing people have a chance at it. So even though the code uses a QR code, or the uh, example here uses a QR code, I wanted to also point out that um, the 12N standard works with other ways of representing data. So the 12N format can be used with traditional barcodes that you're used to seeing on products, can be used with RFID, uh, data matrix, and so on and so forth. So um, we'll stick with QR code though because of a couple of reasons. One is QR codes can hold up to 4,000 characters. Now that depends on the size of the label and the quality of printing and resolution of the camera but they can hold a lot of information in a very small space. Also, QR codes are fairly uh, well known by consumers, so it's not a big leap for them to see a QR code and have an idea that it might have something useful in it. Um, I think the way that uh, 12N formats the information makes it so that there's a whole lot more information that is useful and will be available. So we'll see an increased use of uh, people scanning these things as a result of 12N labels being out there. So uh, the app that's reading it on the smartphone is a free app that uh, we provide it from information and available to everyone. And with, the, uh, with 12N, you can put whatever information you feel is appropriate on the label. So you might create different labels for the same product. Maybe one would be used on the product display, uh, sort of a retail product display. Another might be used on the packaging. Another might be used on the product itself. So the one on the retail display um, would have some information about the product itself, but it might also have a pre-sales button. So you see kind of two thirds of the way down on that phone says pre-sales question. By touching that button, the shopper could speak directly to your uh, sales force or could be chatting with them, you know, and get answers to their questions. So 
if you think about it, for the first time, we have a way as manufacturers of directly affecting sell-through in retail stores. Think of a shopper going through a big box store, thinking about buying a large screen television or a computer or something else where they might have some questions to, um, that they'd like answered in order to decide whether to buy your product or perhaps a competitor's product. Typically, in my example of a big box store, there's not going to be a whole lot of support staff that's going to know the details about your particular product. Of course, your sales team does. So with the pre-sales question uh, button on here, your potential customer is directly in contact with your sales team to answer any questions and hopefully uh, convince them that your product is the best one to get. You'll also notice... Um, that we have like on the third button on there, it says register your, in this case, IMAX. So register your product. So registration cards are typically included with products or there's a website to go to to register your product. But in the U.S. at least, currently less than 1% of all consumers ever register their product. Now, obviously, this information is really useful to manufacturers because they'd like to know who has their product in case of recalls, in case of warranty issues, um, in case of uh, uh, upgrades and trade-ins and so on later on. So by turning this into a single touch of a button to register the product, we make it so simple that we think that most products will end up being registered, which will build the relationship between the manufacturer and the, um, and the consumer and be better for both of them. Uh, you'll also notice the second button says extended warranties. So uh, extended warranties are extremely lucrative for uh, the companies who are selling them. Uh, they, uh, but typically, if a customer doesn't buy the extended warranty at the same time they're making the purchase, they never buy it. On the other hand, companies do allow people to buy extended warranty after they've got the product home, sometimes even a year after because they, they have a warranty and they want to extend it out. So we provide a simple mechanism for uh, the customer seeing that and being able to register for and, and purchase an extended warranty. Um, one button I didn't show here, and remember you can have whichever fields make sense for your product, but one button uh, that I didn't include in this example is troubleshooting. Um, don't know about you, but I frequently have problems with a product and then I have to go to their website and then I have to dig through their website trying to find my product and the troubleshooting information on no, that. This is okay. With the troubleshooting I, this is, um, button, give uh, let me see if I can get back to the control thing here and try and mute everybody. Give me a second here. Um, bum, bum, bum. So, Tony, if you're there, can you tell me where that mute button, mute all thing is again? I guess somebody else muted it for me. Never mind. Um, so, with the troubleshooting button, the consumer is directed immediately to the appropriate page on your website to go through your troubleshooting techniques. And we've been told by a number of companies that a large number of the calls that they get for support are things that the consumer could have dealt with themselves, but the consumer doesn't, or the customer doesn't want to deal with navigating their website and trying to figure out where the information is. On the other hand, you give them a single button that says, try this, try this, try this, you know, um, and it should reduce the number of calls, which of course saves cost. Also, you'll see that there's a, a, a repairs and returns button so that we can more quickly facilitate the returns processing. Uh, we can even uh, hook this to systems so as to uh, create a shipping label uh, to return the product and, and facilitate the whole RMA process. Um, recycling, another interesting area because at end of product life, your question always is with, with it, most products, is where do I send it? How do I recycle this thing? And in some cases, the manufacturer, uh, because of, uh, of regulations like Rojas and We, or uh, for other reasons, will actually accept your product back. So this gives the manufacturer a, a place to indicate specific recycling information for their product or 
uh, for us to fill in local recyclers who handle that particular kind of product. Uh, I mentioned upgrades and trade-ins earlier. It's a great place for manufacturers to include that information uh, so that they can retain customers in the future as the products reach their end of uh, useful life or there's just new products with new features on them. Uh, save the best for, I mean the best, the one I love the most for last, and and that is technical support. Um, I love the technical support button because when I call technical support, I usually spend the first 10 minutes telling somebody how to spell my name, what my address is, my phone number, and then digging around trying to find a model number, serial number, and whatever else they need before they'll even start talking to me. With the technical support button and feature, we have the ability to transmit to the technical support agent all of that information. So when they answer the phone, they can say, hi, I see you're calling about your XYZ product. How can I help you today? And immediately start the phone call. Obviously, a huge savings in time uh, and reduction in frustration for everybody. So to give you a little background, the RLA, uh, a trade association dealing with reverse logistics, created a standards committee, which in turn came up with this labeling standard, worked on it for several years, um, took it to ANSI, and it has now become an official ANSI standard, which RLA uh, manages that standard. So we're in charge of making sure the standard is kept up to date. For um, uh, a, an overview, the 12N format allows us to have an unlimited number of fields, once again, only limited by the amount of space that the symbology takes, meaning how, how big a QR code you have to print in order to get it there, um, and, and the quality of the printer and the quality of the scanner or the smartphone. Um, it's smartphone capable, so each one of these fields that I've been showing could just con contain text, just regular information to be displayed. It could be a URL to your website. It could uh, engage the customer in a text message uh, with your support people or whoever could have images. So uh, each field has the ability to be whatever you need it to be for your application. On top of that, the standard has been developed with international use in mind from day one. It supports multiple languages, multiple currencies, and multiple units of measure, so um, uh, standard, metric, what have you. Um, it also supports several ways of encrypting data, uh, which I can go into if there's any questions, but it's, uh, the encryption can be done on a field-by-field -field basis. So you can have some information on your label that's available for your customers to look at and anybody in the world to look at, and some that is available in an encrypted way where only uh, you or your trading par partners can see that. So some of the applications uh, that we've been talking about, and I'll just kind of fast forward then, um, we've talked about how already how it can increase sales uh, and improve the way you deal with your customers. Uh, we've also touched on the benefits of providing a simple way to register those products and improve returns processing. Several uh, large industry leaders are also looking at 12N labels to identify fraudulent and uh, or counterfeit products. Uh, in some industries, this is a huge, huge product problem. People unknowingly buy counterfeit products or products with counterfeit parts in them, then they rely on the manufacturer of the real product for support, which obviously costs the manufacturer money, and even worse for warranty coverage or repairs. So the 12N labels have several ways of encrypting data, several ways that we can allow manufacturers to identify whether a product is genuine or not before accepting it for return processing or repair processing. Uh, several repair and refurbishing facilities plan on storing details about problems they found and how they were addressed on the 12N labels and then placing those labels actually inside the product because it's really not consumer-oriented information. 
Uh, manufacturers, for those of you who don't know, often use multiple repair or refurbishing organizations around the world. And so when a product comes back, it could be repaired for um, the second time back. It could go to a completely different facility, speaking a different language in a different part of the world. The 12N labels give these refurbishers, repair organizations, a way to share information about prior problems that were diagnosed on, on the product, uh, and uh, as well as add their own information and information about the repairs that were done. So, for instance, if a computer's been returned for three times because of a hard disk problem, that should be the te- a clue to the technician that maybe it's not the hard disk, maybe there's something else that's causing hard disks to fail in that in that machine. Uh, so that's uh, for repairs and refurbishers. Uh, carriers, um, uh, and by this I mean FedEx, UPS, et cetera, et cetera, uh, can also use the 12N label format to store information about not only where a package is going and tracking numbers and so on, but um, information about uh, hazardous materials and special handling that's required. And that was automated logistics. Um, so I'm going to mostly focus in on manufacturers and consumers, but I also wanted to mention as, as I, I guess I did a little bit, that, that uh, there's some uh, interest among the logistics community about using these labels, not just because they have more information and less real estate, but also because they can be uniquely identified, uh, making it that when they scan a label, they know that they're getting the label that they need because we can identify that it's specifically for them. Uh, and it can contain additional information like hazardous materials warnings. Uh, field service and support organizations, as I mentioned, talking about uh, tracking events uh, that have happened with the device or product. Uh, recycling industry, on uh, as these labels are in use on products, we've already created several fields for identifying uh, valuable materials that are in a product, uh, hazardous materials, and so on, so that the recycling process can happen in a more efficient way. Currently, a lot of products go back and just go into a big trash masher that sort of rips them apart and shreds them into little pieces, and they try and separate metal from plastic in that way. Uh, We're hoping by giving more information that we'll have more efficient recycling and reuse. And then, of course, I've mentioned several ways that marketing organizations are looking at using this because of better communication with their customers uh, about uh, uh, warranties, about upgrades, and so on. And also, uh, from a data analytics point of tracking all the different ways in which the product has been um, uh, handled throughout its life cycle. So we know when a label is scanned, if it's scanned in a retail store, we know that it was scanned and what questions the customer asked or what they did next. We know when they get home, whether they registered it and uh, how many times they clicked on the support buttons or had to go back to troubleshooting and things like that. So there's a lot of valuable da- data analytics being acquired throughout the product's life, which in the future we think will be quite useful to a number of organizations. So let's focus in a little bit on uh, manufacturing and then a little bit on cons- consumers. And, um, and then I think I'll just open it up for any questions that that you may have uh, specific to your companies or or any questions in general. So once again, if you think about a typical manufacturing uh, organization, and I'm going to just sort of generalize this a bit, so it may not, uh, there's obviously specifics to your organization that I can't know and, and address from here. But if we think about manufacturing from the consumer related side, obviously we're facilitating uh, contacting support, just as I said, we could contact technical service with a whole bunch of information being electronically transmitted to the technician that you're contacting. We have the same ability to do that with uh, customer support organizations so that when you click a button for customer support, they already know who you are and which products you are, which product you're calling about. Uh, 
Um, obviously, one click to get to documentation, to product registration, RMAs, fraud, um, even support down the line for recalls showing up in a way that uh, uh, flags it to the customer because we already know who's got which product. One of the interesting uses of these labels from an internal standpoint is what we call single scan. So uh, large distribution facilities like Amazon uh, that are shipping thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of products uh, every day, every hour probably, um, when they are, they're scanning the product as it's flying on a conveyor belt out, out the uh, back of the warehouse, <clears throat> they're Time is of the essence. So when they scan, currently they get the UPC number, which, of course, the UPC number can be included in the 12N label. It's just a small amount of space. Um, what they aren't getting is the serial number because that's on some other label, some other place on the box and or may not be on the box. If they could get the serial number, then it's a way of associating that this particular product with this serial number went to this customer which is usually useful for downstream warranty management. Uh, with our labels, obviously, that's possible. And we've mentioned that there's a lot of characters available on uh, uh, using the QR codes with these 12N labels. Um, and we think we'll skip that. Yeah, so I think we've hit enough on that part. Um, manufacturers benefit by consolidating labels and encrypting information uh, for fraud protection. They also benefit because they're getting a tighter relationship with their customers. And also, although I hadn't hit on this much earlier, with their channel partners, their supply chain. So there's an efficient way of transferring information between partners as well as uh, between consumers and uh, producers, manufacturers. Um, and last thing I mentioned was better consumer promotional scores, meaning they're going to do better from a marketing standpoint. So let's talk about the consumer perspective on this. And I, I know some of this is a little bit re repetitious, but just as you put on your consumer hat, obviously the shopping experience is better because now you can have readily have more information so you can make a quicker decision uh, and you can have access to pre-sale support people to get information that you don't have uh, um, just by scanning the label. When you get the product home, it's easy to touch one button and know where the quick start manuals, et cetera, et cetera, are. Uh, so you can get through all that part of your product uh, setup. And this would include IoT devices, uh, which uh, so Internet of Things, so the um, cameras that people are putting up around their houses and smart doorbells and all that kind of stuff. So there's potential there for making it much quicker to install and uh, get those things up and running as a result of using this sort of labeling standard. Uh, I talked about uh, single button click to get through to troubleshooting and technical support, simplifying the way that we can register products and, and deal with warranty claims. And also, we talked briefly about uh, recycling and disposal and giving people various options and telling them what's available based on their specific product. So overall, uh, and please, if you have questions, uh, you know, click on the chat button or we'll just unmute the microphone in a few moments and that way you can speak up if you'd like. Um, overall, the 12N labels reduce the number of labels. They increase sales and they decrease cost. And in as part of doing this, we're finding a way to improve customer retention and cus customer loyalty because we're having a better interaction with our customers throughout the entire product life cycle. Simultaneously, we're addressing issues of fraud and, and counterfeits, which are plaguing some very large companies these days. Uh, cutting down on, as I said, cost of technical support, customer service, and so on, and um, and hopefully making the entire product purchase and product ownership and end-of-life product uh, processes more enjoyable and uh, useful for everybody. 
So uh, I just wanted to mention two websites you can go to for some additional information. Uh, on the information.com website, there's quite a few pages uh, with examples of how these labels can be used uh, by different organizations, different groups, different companies, different uses. So may give you some additional ideas. And on the RLA website, there's also some examples, and there's also the uh, detailed technical specifications for people who are interested in, in that sort of thing. So, great. Um, I think we're at a good place now for questions. If anybody would like to either click the chat button or uh, just speak up, and Tony or whoever's got the button, if you can unmute everyone, then let's just go from there. And I can see we have quite a few people uh, connected from different industries, different companies. So uh, if you have anything specific to your company. Tony, could you say something just so I know that everybody's unmuted? I hear a beep. Bruce? Yeah, okay, I can hear you, Tony. So I guess that means everyone's unmuted now, right? No. Yeah, Bruce? Can you hear me, Dave? Hi. For a moment. Oh, hi. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? Hey, I, I have a quick question. Um, you mentioned a statistic before that, that less than one percent of the people actually register their product. And, yep. Uh, that's that's the first I've heard that statistic. I think that would be a real powerful selling point, point um, for me here because this what we find is that people don't register their product under warranty, and we don't know when it was installed and those kind of things. It's valuable data for. Um, do you have, huh. first of all, how do, how do we get that number, that less than 1%? And the second part of the question is, do you have any estimate or do you have any um, indicator that, you know, what is less than 1%, but under this, using this product, it's 20% or whatever the number might be? Um, yeah, so on the on the first point, yeah, thanks for your comments. I, I, I love that. It's such a simple feature, too. You know, one button, poof, your product is registered, you know, and it's like, so much easier for everybody. Um, and um, I'm glad to hear that you see that it would be valuable. I will, um, I don't have it right at my fingertips. I'll send you a, a reference to the study that was done that came up with that uh, less than 1% number. And, and um, we don't have obviously current numbers about, you know, how this will change it. But I think it's one of those things where it's, it's sort of intuitively obvious. If you have a if you make it this simple to register a product, it's got to get a much higher percentage than anything else that anybody's doing now. You know, it's it's not forcing somebody to get on a computer, get to a website, get to your page, fill out a thousand fields to register. It's not sending out a card with a whole bunch of stuff somebody's got to fill in and then mail. This is simple. You know, it's got to improve it. So. You and I should um, place some bets on what the percentage will actually be when your company implements it. Yeah, I, I, I would hope it would be higher than the 20% even. And just as another kind of follow-up question on that, um, I am assuming, it, or I, I guess my wheels are spinning in my head, that, that somebody would use their smartphone, they'd click on this thing, and that would be their opportunity to register the product. Um, would, it, would it allow um, the – would the app allow – people, uh, would the app allow access to the phone to get the personal information from that person, let's say their name or their address or those kind of things, and then automatically populate that so that they could register, or do they still have to type in all that registration information? Yeah, so, so the, the basic information, when, when, they, um, when they put the app on the phone, uh, there's settings in there so that they can include their name, address, phone number, and use that during the project registration process. Gotcha. So, yeah, so we make it so, you know, you put the information in once and then clicking the registration button is all you need to do. It's, you don't have to keep retyping your name and address and so on and so forth. So, anything else, Dave? No, no, that answers my question. Thank you so much. Okay. Exciting, very exciting product. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's it's really. I'm glad you said that. It's it's interesting to me because the first time I I heard about this idea of like doing something with labeling, I went, yeah, um, yawn. 
you know, it's just it's a label. What's going to be interesting about that? And then as we continued plowing away at how we could get more information on the label, then we started going like, how else can we make the label more useful? And so it got a lot more interesting, a lot more interesting. Um, okay, so I've got a couple of questions people have typed in, and let me go through those. Um, how many fields have you defined? So you saw on the on the phone example, for instance, back here, that there were, I don't know, 10 or something showing up on the phone. This scrolls, by the way, so there could be more. Uh, the Standards Committee has currently defined about 200 of these fields. So like extended warranty is the name of a field, uh, and it's got a special code that we use. Uh, so they've defined about 200 of those, and the process for adding fields is fairly simple. There's just a little form on the website. You fill it out and the uh, standard committee reviews it and um, and then accepts it based on as long as it doesn't, as long as it isn't the same as one they've already accepted. Uh, and that was to make it very simple because as we go into additional industries and uses, there's always special terminology and, and additional fields needed. So when we talked to uh, people who were dealing with recycling, there was there were certain fields for them. Um, when we dealt with the folks who deal with export control, and if any of you have uh, done any commercial shipping internationally, uh, especially with uh, products that have restrictions on them, you know, you can you can ship this, this, and this, but not this or this to this country. Uh, there's a lot of information that's used on that documentation, and so we created fields to put as much as possible on the label. Uh, Obviously, we haven't gotten to the point yet of getting the export people on the docks to just take it off the label, but you can see where that would happen down the line, too. So that was one question. Anybody else with questions? And otherwise, I'll, I'll see about the ones that people have sent in on the chat. Okay. All right, uh, there was another question asked about uh, whether the system can be used with RFID, and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, so um, on the bottom of this screen, you see a little footnote that says it can be used with RFID, uh, which are those little chips that um, they hide in things that store information, uh, it's like the size of a grain. Uh, near field communication, which a bunch of you are probably familiar with because they're using that on phones where you tap the phone next to something or your credit card, you tap it on something and it communicates. Uh, data matrix and other things. These are these are called symbologies in the uh, technical jargon in the industry. Um, but the standard itself is a standard about how data is laid out. And we use QR codes as the primary example because they can hold so much information. So we can get a lot on there. But yeah, it will definitely work with RFID as well. As a matter of fact, I've got a RFID scanner here in my office and we're working on a demo of that. So uh, any other questions? Okay, well, great. In that case, uh, go ahead and wrap it up. Um, Tony or Ron, if you have any uh, final comment you'd like to make, I'll hand it over to you. But uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And please, uh, let me get back to that last slide. Um, yep, not that one. This one, this one. Um, you can also feel free to uh, contact me directly. I guess we didn't put that on here, but um, bruce.brown at information.com. And I'll put up phone numbers and things like that. Uh, if I can get a screen. I don't know if I can edit while I'm showing it to you. Uh, but we'll, we can send that out to everybody, or you can contact us through, through RLA, and we'll get back to you on uh, any other questions or follow-up information or any specific uses you have for your company um, so we can get into more details. So thanks, everyone. Ron? Just say, say one thing quick here, and then I'll let Tony... Uh anything he might want to say. Um, uh, the more we've looked into this, the more, more I'll say, opportunities we found uh, for using them. Uh, expiration dates seem to be uh, for, say, anything related to food or 
medical devices that have a sterility dating on them, um, or we've all had the experience of you know food recalls or medical recalls or expiration dates. You could put all that information in a very small amount of space. Someone could scan it with their app on their phone and then just get all the information about uh, you know is this expired. Um, so there, there are very many places uh, for this. Uh, to be used, I'm working with a colleague on applying for a, uh, a, a grant to uh, to study how this could facilitate the use of you know better proper dosage uh, of, of medications for over the counter and prescription drugs. Um, but this being the Reverse Logistics Association, our, our primary mission is uh, things related to manufacturing, distribution, and refurbishing. Uh, and it's uh, many, as Bruce said, many many opportunities to keep track of repairs that have been done to a product, um, so you can share information in all sorts of ways. And I won't repeat everything Bruce just said, but having the ability to encrypt and control this these information, um, and we have a very simple process for adding fields if somebody wants it. The 200 fields we've defined so far won't work for you. It's very easy for us to add another one. There's a form on the website um, at rla.org slash sqrl. Uh, where people can request fields, and those come straight to my inbox, and we've got a very fast turnaround time on that. So uh, I hope that sparked some interest and some questions, and um, uh,